names um, and your area of expertise and research. Um, my name's Dr. Stephen Bright. I've been interested in this space since 2010 when I co-founded Psychedelic Research in Science and Medicine, and our main goal was to get MDMA research happening in Australia, and we've now achieved that goal. Amazing. <laughs> um, I'm Associate Professor Petra Skeffington. I'm a clinical psychologist. I work in private practice and at Murdoch Beauty. Um, my expertise is around um, PTSD and more complex trauma and recovery. So that's how I came on board for this trial. Yeah. Amazing. How do you two see the MDMA assisted therapy space in, say, like 10 years in Australia? Oh, good question. I know what I want to say. say <laughs> um, what I hope it would look like is that we have more integrated care and mm -hmm. more holistic care um, so that in, instead of buying, like, say, a package of $25,000 worth of therapy, um, that you can work longer term with your therapist, so that you can build the kind of relationship um, that is necessary for the work. Uh, and then dose on a psychedelic substance like as appropriate for the setting, but also at the frequency or like with enough time in between. Uh, so yeah, I think it would be more bespoke healthcare mm. and less interesting and less sensationalized. Mm, there's a lot of hype. And I guess that, uh, uh, for me, um, there's a lot of like numbers thrown around. The expense of the therapy, at, at least at this point in time, seems pretty prohibitive to a lot of people. Do you see that? Do you see the access at, uh, becoming more accessible over time? I think it will become more accessible over time. Like medical cannabis, when medical cannabis, when cannabis was first, um, listed as a schedule eight, in addition to a schedule nine, it was very hard for patients to access. It was prohibitively expensive. And over time, the TGA changed things and, you know, they became more authorized prescribers. And net, you know, to the point we're at today, where it's very easy to access medical cannabis in Australia. Mm. I think. Um, health insurance, initially health insurance companies will, will come in to, to help fund some of the costs provided it can be demonstrated that they're getting, um, good value for their money in the long term, you know, that, that, um, it's saving the money by them providing this therapy. And I had one more thing, but I've forgotten. <laughs> add on though, um, Packages of care in terms of mental health are not familiar to us. Mm, what, so you, what, what do you mean by packages of care? So, um, the usual situation is I'll get a referral to a psychologist perhaps or a counsellor and then I'm going to pay as I go, mm -hmm. session by session. And some of that maybe is rebated through Medicare, you know, the government is soaking up some of those costs. Um, but when someone gets a mental health care plan to see me, we're not saying, right, 10 sessions, that's three grand. Right. Um, and so seeing what I was talking about with the more bespoke treatment that's where I think that will come in. Um, if we cost the per hour on these big packages, you know, 25 grand, um, it's not actually a lot per hour. Mm -hmm. I'm unsure how people would profit from that. So until insurers and government support comes in, yeah. I think it's going to be tough going. Mm. I think the government support, will it will take time. Um, again, it needs to demonstrate that it's cost-effective treatment. But in addition to that, you the numbers are thrown around a lot, things like how effective the treatment is. And so people often cite, you know, two, two in three people no longer meet criteria for PTSD but, uh, after the treatment. But that means one in three aren't. Some of those people aren't getting much relief at all. Mm. Some people may even be getting worse. And we don't really understand why some people get significant benefit and other people are getting no benefit. So I think before it, it, it becomes more widely available, we need to better understand who's going to respond to it because it, it is, at the moment, it's going to be an expensive treatment. True. And um, I mean, you, know, you mentioned briefly about like uh, Tuesday blues and things like that, which I think a lot of, like a, a lot of the general public who uses MDMA uh, recreationally are perhaps familiar with. How have you found, or you, you mentioned in your talk um, briefly that that wasn't really a, an issue. Um, where do you think that those effects come from? And how is that, like, how is it, how have you uh, made better? <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think in terms of the Tuesday blues, hmm. I think the reason it's far more prevalent in 
among people who use MDMA recreationally mm. is partly the, the context that they're using it in, what they're doing. Like if you're dancing, staying up all night, potentially mixing up, taking other drugs, so you've got multiple drugs on board, um, not sleeping well, mm. um, that, that's going to contribute to uh, you know, de- low mood afterwards where we're doing it in clinical trials. We, we, do- we dose people at 8.30 in the morning. Right. Um, it's very different the <laughs> way people are dosing. <laughs> yes. And so, you know, they are sleeping. All of the, all of the people we've worked with that have reported some sleep to, and some, you know, having a good sleep. And in addition to that, there's a, there's a hypothesis I've heard from uh, maybe from Rick Doblin even that um, part of it might come with the amount that people use and the frequency of use. Mm. So the, basically what I'm saying is that maybe the more that you use MDMA, the more likely you are to have that sort of come down effect. And I think it's interesting because we've worked with somebody who has used MDMA extensively in the past along with other drugs, but that was a long time ago, like 10 years or more ago. So maybe over time, you know, the, the brain is plastic and, mm. and sort of goes back to baseline so that people don't experience that come down. Question, what do you think the public needs to know about MDMA-assisted therapy as it stands right now to avoid some of the hype which which has been talked about. I think expectations can be lowered by focusing on the one in three people that aren't cured of PTSD rather than mm. focusing on two in three that, that are. And I think as well, um, oh, I've lost my train of thought again. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say there's no such thing as a magic pill. Mm. And so believing that you could take this and it's just the act of taking MDMA that resolves PTSD, that's not the case. Um, trauma heals through processing and it's very intense. It's much more difficult than people realize. Um, yeah, it's not easier than a conventional psychotherapy. It's much, much more intense than that. And, and yeah. that's an example of why I trust the process because that's what I wanted to say, but you said it much better. Amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs>